We've been married 52 years this August. August the 18th of this year, it'll be 50 years. We met back in 1971. It was a blind date that I was doing a favor for a friend of mine. Well, when I first met him, he drove up to my house to take me on a date to go to the bank. Since we were a blind date, I'm standing at the window and I want to see who's coming, right? So I look out the window and I see this young man. First I see the car and the car was, you know, women. Ooh, that's a nice car. And then he gets out the car and looked like he just got out and got out. He was so tall. And I said, I'm done. We actually met when he was dating my sister. So I just... I dated her sister first and then I saw her and I decided she was the better catch, I guess. <laughs> We've been married for 63 years this past June 24th. We don't even have to talk. <laughs> I can think it, and he says it. I called her in the middle of the week. It was the 70s. I asked her to go disco dancing. Thankfully, my dad got some uh, tickets to a Royals game. The Royals were in postseason play. Well, I had no idea what kind of a dancer he was. I didn't know how if that would be awkward, but I knew I'd enjoy a baseball game. So it was a it was a safe it was a safe date. One word I would use to describe a healthy marriage is compassion. Uh, often we get so involved and so busy doing our thing and doing what we want to do and reaching our goals and accomplishing the things that we want to accomplish that we sometimes forget about just compassion for uh, our spouse. Trust, because being as young as we were, getting married, I had to trust him. There was nothing else I could do. I, all I had was an example of my mother and father. So here I am getting married. So I would have to trust him no matter what. Well, I would say commitment. I think when you get married, you know, when I got married, I put my hand on a Bible and made a vow before God till death do us part. And I took that pretty seriously. And I think God does too. We grew up uh, with those Christian friends, the support of our Christian friends in the church. Our kids grew up there. I wish I knew then what I know now about uh, leaning on your faith. That's come, that just has come with growth, that kind of thing. If you were asking me where we draw our strength from, it has to be from God. The things that we've gone through, and, and you know, I think sometimes the Lord allows things to happen in your life that will help you grow. And uh, we've gone through some of those, but God's always been faithful. In 2014, Bruce and I were in a serious car accident and I had two broken legs and I was in a wheelchair. I will never forget one morning it was shortly after the accident had happened, and I heard the shower running in the bathroom. I looked at him and I said, did you, did you leave the shower running? And he, he got really quiet and he said to me, well, I wanted to make sure that the temperature was regulated in the shower for you because I knew you wouldn't be able to reach the knobs before I helped you into the shower. I remember vividly just sitting there for several seconds and looking at him and saying, thank you. And it was priceless. It told me that I was cherished. The willingness to forgive, the willingness to go back and say, I'm sorry, and to uh, swallow your pride. And that's, I guess that's one thing I went into the marriage with, with a sort of a chauvinistic mindset and watching her forgive me when she knew that I was wrong was huge. And I think that that over the years has uh, probably impacted me more and strengthened our marriage from my perspective more than anything. Praise be to God. Amen. <laughs> Members of our church, 50, 60 years of marriage. Thank you for leading the way for the rest of us to follow. Give it up for them right now. Praise be to God. So many more that we could share that we did not. Listen, you don't get a marriage of 50 or 60 years where you haven't built a castle, and that's what this series is. A series on the family, because every home is a castle, every castle is be somebody's home, and you're either building a sandcastle story that'll wash away, that will decay, that will fade away, or you're building a castle on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what this is about, learning how to build a home, a family, a marriage that'll stand the test of time. This is Conway Castle. I showed you Conway Castle week one, 
the place I have been. I want you to notice like every castle, this castle being over 700 years old, it is still there today and it'll be there hundreds of years from now because of where it's built and how it's built. You see, your family will be defined by where it's built and how it's built. Every castle was built on a higher elevation, on a strong foundation. We learn that Jesus is the Word of God and the Son of God, and He's the right location. He's the higher elevation. He's the strong foundation. Those castles had walls for fortification, for protection. Now, I haven't talked about the watchtowers. See the watchtowers on this? These watchtowers were for people to watch for the enemy. And you understand there's an enemy of your family. And that's the nature of what we're learning in Psalm 127 and verse one, it says this, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Meaning if God is not your builder, God cannot be your protector. And every ancient city had walls of protection to keep the enemy on the outside from it getting on the inside. And those ancient cities were like a castle with those walls of fortification. And then they had watchtowers. Now, I was able to actually tour that castle in Conway several years ago. Chris and I actually climbed to the top of one of those watchtowers. There we are on the watchtower, and was from up there that we could see for miles and miles around. And it was a thing of beauty. I mean, I remember looking around, realizing how beautiful Wales is, and we could see farther than we could ever see. And everywhere we looked was a, a thing of beauty, and we could see this breathtaking scenery. But you understand, 700 years ago, there were people in that watchtower, and they were not there to revel in the scenery. No, they were there to watch for the enemy. And do you understand there's an enemy of your family? And Jesus talked about it. He told us about it. He warned us about it. In John 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, there's a thief, that is Satan, that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come to give you life, and you can have it more abundantly. And everything Jesus wants to give you, Satan wants to steal from you. And you understand, when it comes to your family, when it comes to your marriage, it cannot be destroyed on the outside. It can only happen when the enemy gets on the inside. And every single day, you've got these walls of fortification like a castle around your home, but there's the same serpent that wants to slither through a crack in the wall to get on the inside of your family the way he did on the first family. You remember we've talked about Adam and Eve, that first couple ever, that match made in heaven. And the very same thing that Satan did to them, he wants now to do to you. And he cannot do it on the outside of those walls. No, he can only do it if you let him on the inside side of those walls. And you see, the reality is Satan's strategy to bring about our family's destruction. It is always by way of family division. Now, when I talk about family division, I'm really talking about marital division. See, strong families are made of strong marriages. And this is why your marriage is under attack daily. Remember what it says in Ephesians 6, 12. This is a spiritual struggle. This is a spiritual war. There are unseen enemies that want to destroy your family. Ephesians 6, 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world. And in the very same way, it was Satan that was able to divide the first ever couple and the first ever marriage. He wants now to divide your marriage and divide your family so ultimately, he can bring about a family's destruction because it impacts even future generations. This was Jesus' warning in Matthew 12, 25. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So in every single castle, you have a king and you have a queen. You have a husband. You have a wife. And the two of you stood at an altar, much like this one, at one time, and guess what we've talked about? Remember this, Genesis 2.24, the two shall become one flesh, and you take your vows in the eyes of God, and God said, I no longer see two of you, and I only see one of you, and the two of you became one. But what happens over the course of time, subtly, slowly, weeks, months, and years, all of a sudden you wake up one day and you realize suddenly the two that had become one, the one has now become again two. And there's this chasm, there's this separation. 
Now, I don't know who I'm speaking to today, not for sure, but God knows everything about you. And I want you to understand what we're going to do today. We're going to build a bridge of reconciliation. Because you understand these couples that we've just heard from, they've been married 50, 60 years. They didn't just get lucky. Nothing happens that way. Nobody just lucks into a happy marriage for 50 or 60 years. No, here's the reality. The real miracle is not falling in love. That's easy. The real miracle is staying in love over the course of decades. <laughs> And I want you to see the, the real miracle is not falling in love. That, that just kind of can happen accidentally. The real miracle is staying in love when you've been looking at the same person for the last five decades. That's the miracle. But understand something. It's not because it just happens randomly or accidentally. It's because two people have learned to build a bridge of reconciliation. Not in the point of crisis. Not waiting till we're on the brink of divorce. But every single day. Every time that the serpent, I'm talking Satan, brings just a little bit of division. And trying to slide through that wall of separation. You're learning to build a bridge of reconciliation. In times of family division, you must choose to build a bridge of reconciliation. What is reconciliation? To be reconciled to someone is when you used to be together, you used to be one, you're one accord of one mind, one person, and then something happens and you become enemies. You're estranged. You're in a place of hostility. And now to be reconciled means two people who were once enemies have now become one again. They're at peace with each other. And that, understand, it, is what God did for us. You understand that 2,000 years ago, the sinless Son of God came like the sons of men to die for our sin so that we could be forgiven. You know why? Because the Bible still teaches that we were estranged from God. We were separated from God. Because of our sin, there was the separation between God and men. Because God is holy, that means he is sinless, and you and I, by nature, are sinful. There's a separation between God and men. No, we're not all God's children. You're not born the first time as a child of God. You're born the first time as a fallen son of Adam or a fallen daughter of Eve. That's why Jesus said in John 3, you must be born again. What happened? Jesus came to die for our sin. It was there that he bridged the gap between God and men. He paid the penalty for our sin. He took our stain, our shame, our blame. He offered the peace offering before God. We were at war with God because sin is rebellion against God, but it was Jesus that has reconciled us now to God. Now check this out. The same thing Jesus did for us, he now charges us to do for others. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Do you understand that what we have as Christians is a ministry of reconciliation? The good news of the gospel is about reconciliation. This book that we study, the Bible, is a book about reconciliation. And what God now says, because I have reconciled you to God, I've reconciled you to me, now you have the power to be reconciled one to another. And I'm not waiting to be on the brink of divorce. I mean, anything that doesn't get constant intention and attention will eventually atrophy. And that is why marriages begin to die slowly of atrophy. It's almost never by a single brutal blow. It's almost always death by a thousand cuts. That's how it happens. That's how you wake up one day and he's over there and she's over there. You used to be here and now you're there and there's this chasm and separation and you have a choice in that moment. Your decision will define your destination in the heat of an argument, in the heat of separation, in the heat of division. You have a choice. You can either build a throne or you can build a bridge. This was me three weeks ago. I know, three weeks ago feels like three months ago, all right? This was the sermon I preached, right? Three weeks ago, there's only one throne in the castle. There's a king and a queen, <laughs> but there is a high king whose name is Jesus. And the way you bring peace to the home is you get off the throne of your home. That was me on the throne of my home. Look at me there. Do I look silly? I have a paper crown on. That's me on the throne of my home. It's all about control. I'm in charge of my home. It's my way. I'm gonna fight for my opinion. 
I'm going to make the decision. And we fight for things and we build these paper kingdoms with paper crowns of things that don't last and don't matter, that will not impact the forever. And consequently, instead of being on the love seat where you started, all of a sudden you're sitting alone on the throne. It's lonely on the throne. And in the heat of an argument, in the heat of division, when Satan's trying to bring separation to divide that kingdom, you have a choice. You can build a throne or you can build a bridge, a bridge of reconciliation. Today, church, we're going to build a bridge. There are some that walked in here today and others under the sound of my voice in every church house in America and every single campus across our city. There are couples right now that are pictured by this. He's over there. She's over there. She's got her throne. He's got his throne. And it's really a war for control of the home. And he's injured her and she's injured him and they've hurt each other. And after years and years and years, some of you are in crisis. Some of you wonder if we can even hang on another month. I'm not even sure we'll be married another year. Today, I am fighting for your marriage. Jesus is fighting for your marriage. Will you fight for your marriage? It's worth fighting for. Now, Jesus taught in Matthew 19, sometimes divorce is the only option. In the mind of God, he never would have dreamed it for you. He never wanted it for you. 40 to 50% of us here today have been divorced. You need to understand God's not mad at you. He's not done with you. God has a plan for you. God the Father himself has revealed, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 8, that he himself is a divorcee. He knows the pain of what you're going through. And he wants you to understand, he knows your pain. If you've been divorced, you know why it's so painful? Because Jesus said in Genesis 2, 24, the two shall become one flesh. A man shall leave father and mother and be joined to his wife. Now, you study that Hebrew word joined, it implies a bonding or a gluing that can never be separated. That's why divorce is so painful. In the same way, you have particle board or you have um, plywood. This is wood, pieces of wood that have been glued together, bonded together. And you understand, I can break it in half, but you can never separate the pieces that were glued together. They're still glued together. You see what happens in times of divorce is you can break the, the one so that it now becomes two, but there's still pieces that are stuck to each other forever. And that is why divorce is always painful. It's a traumatic amputation that has the power even to affect future generations. I'm trying to say sometimes divorce is not an option. Some of you fought for your marriage and your, your, your spouse still walked away, but listen very carefully if you're still married. I don't care if it's your first time around, second time around, third time around, your marriage is worth fighting for. And today, I'm gonna teach you how to fight for your marriage. Not by building a throne, but by building a bridge, a bridge of reconciliation. So that's what we're gonna do. And what I'm gonna share with you today is true of marriage relationships And it's true of all relationships. We're going to build a bridge of reconciliation. Now, here's the reality. In marriage, it takes both of you working together, not just one of you. That's why there are... Come back here. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Building a bridge is not easy. Building a throne is easy. Just sit there and be stubborn. Just sit there and be proud. Sit there and be stubborn. Building a throne is easy. Building a bridge is work. I'm going to be working up here. Now, here's what I want you to know. It's not enough for just one of you. It takes both of you. It takes two of you. It's not enough for the king to do his part and the queen just to sit there and not do her part. There's two beams. There's two beams of reconciliation. There's her part and there's his part. You ready for this? This is her part. You got the king and the queen sitting on the throne, but they're getting off the throne now. They're building a bridge so that once again, they can be reconciled one to another. So I want to give you the steps today 
in any point of separation, guys, Chris and I have had to do this over and over again. We will have been married 32 years October the 5th. 32 years. I cannot even imagine it's been that long. We have. We've been married 32. I cannot even fathom how we got here. One day at a time, that's how you get here. People ask sometimes, well, how old are your kids? 28, 26, and 25. And then they'll look at Kristen and they'll say, you look so young. I can't believe you have kids that age. And then I'm expecting them to look at me. <laughs> you know, give me some love. But they, it never happens. Never, never, never. Yeah, we do. We have kids that age. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're old. We're getting there. Not 50 years, not 60 years, but we're working on it. And I'm trying to tell you, you don't even get to the 32 years, much less 50, 60 years, if you haven't learned how to build this bridge of reconciliation. We've learned to build this bridge over and over again, almost daily, because we need to, almost weekly. Don't wait till the separation gets here. Begin when it's right here. Honey, I'm sorry for the way I just spoke to you. Will you forgive me? See, that's how you do it. You start building that bridge instantly when you realize Satan has slithered in there. He's bringing this division. There's just this little crease, little crack of separation. You learn to do it instantly, immediately. And I'm telling you this because people have looked at Chris and I over the years, and they'll say something like, man, Pastor Phil, you and Krista, you just make it look so easy. Yeah, that's because you don't go home with us. I'm telling you, after 32 years, it's easier. It's easier than it was. But the nature of living with someone, even like Krista, because I've been married a long time, gentlemen, and even living with lovable, huggable, whoever you're married to, even living with them, part angel. Listen, it doesn't matter. It's not going to be easy, not all the time. There are days it's going to be easy. Some days it's not going to be easy at all. You start to learn to do the hard work of building a bridge of reconciliation. The question is not, will your marriage work? The question is, will you work your marriage? And today, I'm going to do some work up here. I'm building a bridge of reconciliation. And the first step demands humility. The first step demands humility. The first step is you've got to decide you're going to abandon your throne. You've got to abandon that desire to be in control. And it demands humility. Jesus said, I've come to give your marriage life abundantly, but there is no life abundantly apart from humility. So the first step is humility, choosing humility over being proud, choosing humility over wanting your control. And so the first step is humility. Now, you need to pray for me, because if you know me well at all, you know I don't build things. I grow things, I don't build things. There are two kinds of men on this planet, men who get paid to build things and other men who pay men to build things. <laughs> I'm in the second group. All right, so this is very scary. Please pray for me. Church houses, campuses, right here in Lee Summit, I'm serious, because I'm gonna walk across this bridge before the day is over. And it's very, very scary. So, here we go. The first step is humility. Here we go. I should probably stop right now. This seems to be going well. Here we go, all right? First step is humility. Okay, it was just a matter of time. I told you, I don't build things. I'm doing my best up here. Woo! First step is done. You know what I'm saying? Stress, duress in my marriage is when my wife asked me to hang something on the wall what should take 10 minutes end up being two hours, and when you finally think you're there, you let go of the picture, and it does like this. I have lost my Christianity. I've almost lost my marriage more than once. Holes in the wall everywhere. Stress, duress. Yeah, the person most impressed if I actually execute this bridge is my wife, okay? I'm telling you. First step is humility, guys. Perhaps the hardest step is humility. The hardest step is usually the first step. Because humility says, I'm letting go of control. I want you to see what I think might be the most foundational verses of any marriage. 
If we can just do these two things in marriage, it'll revolutionize, it will radically change your marriage. Look at what it says, Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. If you have to have your way all the time, do not get married. If you always have to be right and prove you're right, please, 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 for your sake and others, do not get married. <laughs> Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. If I was going to write a book on marriage, I'm actually currently working on a book on the Song of Solomon. It's all about love and romance and singleness and dating and marriage and sex. It's going to be awesome. One of the chapters of that book, it ought to be just don't be selfish. Second chapter, don't be selfish. Third chapter, don't be selfish. That's part of the battle, just don't be selfish. If you're willing to be selfless, you've got a shot. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem others better than himself, let each of you look not on your own interest, but also on the interest of others. Humility says, I'm going to look on the interest of my spouse instead of my self-interest, her needs, not my needs, her desires, not my desires. And in the heat of separation, an argument, a fight, a spat, call it what you want. The key is this. Listen carefully. Stop fighting to be understood and start fighting to understand. Everybody's fighting to be understood. No, listen. Stop fighting to be understood and start fighting to understand. This demands that you lean in, stop talking, and listen. Everybody wants to do all the talking. It means, honey, help me see what you see. Get behind somebody else's eyeballs. Honey, help me understand. I'm listening. And while they're doing the talking, you're not going, you know, what can I say to come back? What's my zinger? What am I going to say? No, no, you're, you're honestly listening. And all of a sudden, you're taking the first step of reconciliation. You're trying to understand. Now, that, listen, that, listen, you don't have to fully agree to fully understand. Chris and I have decided, listen, there are things we will just always disagree on. We don't fully agree on a lot of things. We, am, we married opinionated people. <laughs> it, with things we fight, it's about opinion. Sometimes it's not about right or wrong. We just have different opinion. Here's the point, reconciliation does not demand that you fully agree or nobody to ever be reconciled to anything. It means we fully understand. We're gonna sit, we're gonna listen. And if you will, there are times you'll find out that you were wrong. Sometimes you'll walk away and go, you know what, we're both right. It's not a matter of truth, this versus this. We just disagree, we have different opinion, okay. We can live with that. Now listen, we're not done. We're just taking our first step. Second step, you gotta take responsibility. And this is a hard step, I'll tell you why. Because most people don't wanna own anything. Reconciliation demands we all own our stuff. And y'all listen, this is why marriage counseling only works about 25% of the time because two people won't do this. Take responsibility. I've been through it over and over again. In my pastoral ministry, somebody will call it Pastor Phil or perhaps make an appointment with one of our counselors. And uh, I realized right away, the real reason we're here and the real reason you called is you want Pastor Phil to fix your spouse. You're not really trying to fix your marriage. You just want somebody to side with you against them to fix them. No, the reality is what I have learned. It doesn't matter the situation, the reason for the separation. There's enough blame to go around for everybody. No marriage gets there solely because of one person or the other. And so it begins by every person looking for ways We're on a roll. Let's keep this going. Everybody's saying, I'm, I'm responsible. I'll own my stuff. I've got to own something. There is no reconciliation without everyone. Look, I don't care if your spouse is 90% wrong. You start looking for what, what can I own here? 
There's always something to own. It begins with taking personal responsibility. Stop playing the blame game and repent. Do you understand the first couple, all was well in paradise. We talked about it. We studied it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, the two were naked and not ashamed, the man and the woman. I mean, everything was perfect. Everything was amazing. The two had become one flesh. They were naked and not ashamed, complete intimacy, complete unity. And then they did the one thing God said not to do, and they sinned, and the cover-up began. And the blame game began. Genesis 3, verse 11, you know what happens? God looks at Adam and says, Adam, what have you done? Have you eaten of the tree which I told you not to eat? Now, does anybody think in Genesis 3, God did not know what Adam had done? He's omniscient, he's all-knowing, yet he's asking Adam, have you eaten of the tree which I told you not to eat? Yeah, he knew what Adam had done. What was he trying to get Adam to do? Same thing you're trying to do when you tell your little toddler, little Johnny, don't touch that vase. Oh, by the way, next week begins parenting. I got two weeks of parenting. You know why we're going there? Because I'm watching little toddlers train their parents instead of parents training their toddlers. (laughs) Really, sometimes I'm going, who's raising who here? You need to child-proof your house. Don't house-proof your child. Really, the training begins early. This next, we're going to start that next week. You look at little Johnny, don't touch that vase. What's little Johnny want to do? The same thing every human being wants to do. As soon as you turn your back, <laughs> he's touching the vase. Next thing you know, you hear a crash, bang. You turn around and you go, what have you done? Or more, more like, what have you done? You know what he's done. What do you want him to do? take responsibility for what he's done. That's what God is doing with Adam. He sinned. Own it. Own your stuff. But instead of owning his stuff, what does he do? Genesis 3 and verse 12. I'll tell you what he does, God. The woman you gave me, she's the one that gave me to eat. And by the way, God, you gave me the woman. So it's the woman's fault, and you gave me the woman, so it's partly your fault. Spoken like a true man. Blame game begins. God gets blamed. How many times does God get blamed for things God didn't do? Church gets blamed. Pastor gets blamed. Listen, you did it. You made the mess, the two of you. It's nobody else's fault. Own your stuff. Decisions define destinations. So what happens next? You got Adam that blames his wife and partly blames God. Then God turns to the wife, Eve, have you eaten of the tree? Sniffle, sniffle, it was the serpent, his fault. He tricked me, and I did eat. So now you have Adam that blames the wife, and you have the wife that blames Satan. The devil made me do it. The blame game begins, and the blame game has been deeply embedded on the fallen DNA of the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, and all God wants you to do is own your stuff. Stop playing the blame game. It's nobody else's fault, not her fault, not his fault. I'll take responsibility. That is the beginning of reconciliation. All of a sudden, the cover-up ends, and the cleanup can begin. It means you have to stop the blame game and repent. Repent of the sin. Listen carefully. Divorce is not always a sin. Matthew 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But it's always sin that causes divorce. It's not always a sin, but it's always sin that causes it. Repent of the sin that's causing the chasm, the separation. Number three, give and receive forgiveness continually. I used to think in a happy marriage, a healthy marriage, you never need to say, I'm sorry because you're doing everything perfectly. No, I've learned I need forgiven daily. You know why? Because all we are is human. You're just married to a human. You're only human, which means unwittingly or wittingly. I didn't mean to. I didn't try to. I hurt my wife. I had a bad moment. I got on the wrong side of bed. I snapped when I shouldn't have. Honey, I am so sorry. Will you forgive me? See, in a healthy marriage, you're giving forgiveness and you're receiving forgiveness almost daily, if not weekly. 
These couples we heard from in this video, they didn't get their 50 years of marriage, 60 years of marriage without learning how to build this bridge of reconciliation. And I guarantee they have learned the power of, I am sorry, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me of how I spoke to you? Will you forgive me of how I mistreated you? Will you forgive me of how I just disrespected you? And very quickly then you've closed the gap. Instead of it getting here, it was here, and now you've closed it instantly simply by taking responsibility, by having a heart of humility, and then asking forgiveness. And you understand this is all about the gospel, Ephesians 4.32. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. In the same way God has forgiven you, now God says, I want you now to forgive others too. You say, but I can't forgive. I don't feel forgiveness. I want to kill them. Of course you do. They hurt you. They betrayed you. They injured you. Of course you want to strangle them. There have been people in this world, I'm, I might have committed homicide, but Jesus said I couldn't. I mean it metaphorically. Relax. It's a metaphor. But here, here, here's the point. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Nowhere in Scripture does God command a feeling. You know why? Because you can't command your feelings. You can't not feel how you feel. What is God commanding? Not an emotion. He's commanding a decision. Forgiveness is a decision. To simply say, I will no longer hold this against them. I'll no longer hold it over them. I release them to God to be their judge, and God will deal with them in his own way in his time. They're not mine. That's forgiveness. And all of a sudden, what you're doing by a decision that's sometimes void of an emotion, eventually the emotion follows the decision. So you wake up one day and you realize, I, I actually feel it now. It doesn't begin with the feeling. The feeling follows right thinking. Right thinking eventually, repeat again, over and over again. It's never a one and done. Eventually, right thinking will begin to define right feeling. I really forgive the one that's injured me now. And this is why God commands us to do that. Some of us need to forgive our ex-spouse. They have injured you. They betrayed you. They left you. Yet years and years later, they continue to control you. You know why? Because forgiveness is about freedom, not theirs, yours. You put yourself behind the bars of bitterness. When Jesus said, pray for your enemy, it's not for their benefit, it's for yours. He wants you to be free. Listen, there can be forgiveness without reconciliation, but there can be no reconciliation without forgiveness. For some of us here, reconciliation is not an option, but forgiveness always is. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He forgave the men that nailed him to a cross. They never confessed their sin. They never acknowledged the need to be forgiven. They never said, God, will you forgive? No, he forgave them unconditionally. See, forgiveness is unconditional. It's not conditional on them, conditional on your own heart decision. Reconciliation may be not be an option. Forgiveness still is. And where there is forgiveness, it has the power to lead to reconciliation. And then the last step on this road to reconciliation, this bridge of reconciliation is grace. I need a lot of grace in my marriage. Believe it or not, Krista needs a little bit of grace. <laughs> not near as much as I do, but we all do. What is grace? Grace is God giving us something we don't deserve. We didn't deserve forgiveness. We were guilty. We deserve justice. Why do we want forgiveness for ourselves but justice for everybody else? See, what God is saying is now, in the same way I gave you the forgiveness you don't deserve, that's called grace. I want you now to give that same grace away. That is how you build this bridge of reconciliation. And church, I know what I'm talking about, both theologically and practically. 32 years of marriage. I don't know where we would be today. Krista and I, was there not year 14? 
By year 14, this was us. I was here, she was here. I don't know how it happened. Year after year after year, just that subtle increased separation that happened through a pattern of sin and dysfunction. Dysfunction is another word we use today for sin. For 14 years, I would have told you, oh, I'm a Christ-like husband. I'm an Ephesians 5.25 kind of husband. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. I would have said, oh, I'm that kind of husband. I would die for my wife. I'd lay my life down for my wife. No, the reality is every time we had an argument, every time she hurt me, every time she injured me, I would build a throne instead of building a bridge. And I could give you all the reasons why I don't have time. The things that God showed me thereafter, I'll have to share another time. But my pattern would go something like this. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Am I doing any good at all? A man has two mirrors, his wife and his work. The work said, you're amazing. But once in a while, the mirror would look back to me at home and say, no, you're not doing good at all. And you know what? It wasn't about my wife. It was about me, my own insecurities, my own anxieties, and something about a man, he will do whatever he has to to hang on to that sense of strength and there's something about a wife that can make him feel weak and a man will retreat from anything that makes him feel weak and so when the mirror would make me feel weak and it was more about me and my brokenness in me than it was about her I would retreat and I might not talk to my wife for three full days not one word I would sit on my throne, taking back control. And that pattern that began maybe once a year in the early days became twice a year, then maybe once a month. By year 14, it was once a week. My wife would say something, do something, usually not that much at all. My trigger was such a hair trigger. That's the nature of a soul wound, an injury. I didn't know I had, but I did. In year 14, I remember turning over at night. I was mad. I was gonna to go to sleep mad, I was gonna wake up mad, I wasn't gonna to talk to my wife for three days. Something happened that night, I heard my wife crying, quietly weeping in the darkness of the night. And when I did, I heard the words of the Holy Spirit just as distinctly as you can hear the words coming out of my mouth. Inwardly, I heard these words, if you don't take care of her, you could lose her. And in that moment, my heart was broken, but not broken by the sin that had broken my heart years earlier. And that sin had brought that dysfunctional pattern into my marriage. It was now broken by the Holy Spirit. And for the first time, I realized I was sitting on a throne and I needed to build a bridge. I'm five years into my pastoral ministry. I know now Satan wanted to destroy my ministry by destroying my marriage. He could have succeeded. Decisions define destinations. And I did something that night I'd never done before, where before I had turned away, that night I turned in. And you know what I did that night? For the first time, I realized what it meant to love my wife as Christ loved the church. All those times before, I was turning away from the pain. All those times before, I refused to take the nails. All those times before, I did not want to bear the cross. I was trying to save my life and hang on to my life and preserve my life. And that night I turned in and I said, honey, if you will forgive me I will love you the way you deserve till the day I die I don't care what you do to me I don't care if you hurt me I was afraid of being hurt 
I don't care what you say to me, how you treat me. I will love you forever unconditionally. That night, I chose the nails. And gentlemen, I'm trying to tell you today, ladies, I'm trying to tell you today, you can get a new marriage without getting a new mate. See, I got a new marriage when God got a new man. And when God got the man that he always wanted, I finally got the marriage that I always wanted. And just like Jesus, 2,000 years ago, he walked up this hill called Calvary. And it was there on this hill called Calvary that he built this bridge of reconciliation between God and men. In the very same way, he chose humility. He accepted responsibility so that we could be forgiven of our sin. He showed us God's grace, though we were guilty. That is the very thing now that you can do in the same way Jesus spread out his hands to spread this gap between God and men. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and coming found in the fashion as a servant and being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And I'm trying to tell you, today is the day that you, as a child of God, filled with the Spirit of God, can emulate the Son of God and be reconciled to each other. You can snatch the victory from the jaws of the enemy. And looking back, that's exactly what happened. Together, Chris and I built this bridge of reconciliation that has redefined forever our destination. I don't know where we would be. That was 18 years ago. And how many times have had, we had to retrace those steps to build that bridge again and again and again. Satan has a plan for your home to destroy not just your family, but even future generations, to destroy your children and that legacy and that family tree spiritually. And today, everything can change. Church, I wanna challenge you to be like Jesus. Reconciliation is what makes you like Jesus. That night, I told Krista several things. One of the things I told her is, honey, I'm gonna pray with you. I'm gonna pray for you every single day for the rest of my life. I wanna challenge you, if you're a married couple, wherever you are in the world, I challenge you, take the dare. It'll change everything to release the supernatural power of God in your marriage. Pray together every day. I didn't pray with my wife for 14 years. Here I am, a pastor. I pray in front of hundreds of people. Hardly ever pray with my wife. You know why? Because it meant vulnerability. Transparency, intimacy, it's not easy. That changed immediately. I wanna challenge you to pray every single day together for each other, over each other. Began to pray, God, thank you for my spouse. It's impossible to be mad at your spouse when you're saying, God, thank you for my spouse. All of a sudden, those irritations that were so magnified, you're like, Just start to thank God for the one God gave you. Pray and repent of anything you've done to mistreat your spouse. There are days I gotta say, honey, will you please forgive me for the way I spoke to you? And then I pray, God forgive me for today, the way I spoke to your your daughter, the way I treated your daughter. It's powerful. I challenge you. Pray and ask God's blessing over your spouse, your marriage. God, would you bless my marriage? God wants to bless you. Life abundantly. (laughs) Abundant joy, abundant love, uh, abundant intimacy, what you were made for. Snatch the victory from the jaws of the enemy. Satan is a liar. God is a truth teller. Pray for God to guard your spouse and your marriage from the wicked one. This is spiritual warfare. And when you pray, you release the power of heaven into your home. So right now, wherever you are in the world, if you're married, wherever you are, whether you're here in crisis or you're here, I want you to take your spouse right now by the hand. And I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna sing. But I want you to sing 
I just want you to pray while somebody else sings. I dare you. It'll change everything. It'll never be the same. Jesus, I pray for every single marriage under the sound of my voice that you would release the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of heaven. Lord, men and women here sitting on a throne, king and a queen, a house divided, I pray that God today, they would get off that throne, that they would build a bridge, a bridge of reconciliation that would redefine forever the destination of their family for generations to come. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die? Sometimes you just need a bump to establish a new pattern in your home, a prayer pattern. So I want you to do this. If you're a wife, I want you to text 68618, the word wife, and you're going to get 21 days of prayer. So you can pray for your husband, with your husband. If you are the husband, I want you to text 68618, the word husband, and you're going to get 21 days of prayer prompts, little prayers that you can use to pray with your wife, that you can use to pray for your wife. And I promise you, on the authority of God's word, it will transform your marriage. If you'll do this, 21 days of prayer, give it a shot. I promise you will not be disappointed. I pray, God, you'd bless every person here, single or married, that you would have your perfect way in all of our lives, that you alone would sit on the throne of our hearts, our homes, that we'd be people of reconciliation, having been reconciled to the living God through the Son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Give Jesus the glory today, church. Would you praise him?